all have seen it on our face and yet it is still perplexing the uh, the significance of this particular corona pandemic is that uh, every decade people say that we face a pandemic but then for our generation i think uh, it's something which we have seen it um, and different uh, issues which one can look into the fear the the perplexity the complexity of the virus and even the that even there's been a lot of debate between the scientists and uh, if if the scientists are taking contradictory views we can imagine how a common person will feel it or face it or respond to it and uh, going after uh, uh, once we are looking at the different phases of a pandemic from phase 1 to phase 2 we have seen the destruction and we have seen the deaths uh, across families and nobody could anticipate that so many deaths could happen in the second wave and again um, there is uh, this assumption that there will be third wave and it was going to hit the younger children so all these things are very uh, in the sense uncertain times people and especially younger ones are feeling lot uncertain sitting inside the house for months together uh, it's really taking toll on their mental health also um, and uh, again this is a pandemic so this becomes an important issue for ministry of health which is managing the affairs but at the same time working uh, on disaster issues i feel it's equally important a disaster issue but then if you look on ground uh, these two departments may not be working together so there are few sessions where together they are working of course the dm act both 2005 and we have looked into the pandemic act also but then uh, many of these issues uh, are not well coordinated and we have seen the fallout because of non responsiveness at times and uh, even though we face so many issues in the first wave we are still facing the same in the second wave i think there are a lot of things which needs to be discussed on the coordination part between the different ministries on the disease itself on the on the spread and the containment itself and now as we are going for unlocking even now there's so much of uncertainty whether one should open and how much to open uh without taking much time i would uh, be very keen to listen to all the four uh, speakers on a very important topic but i i would now request my co-chair dr meenakshi to take the proceedings ahead and maybe in the end if there's time i can comment uh, for a while dr meenakshi thank you thank you ma'am my pleasure to be with you as a co-chair thank you vipin sir uh i think in this session we have four presenter and the first with your permission ma'am may i request the first presenter to present his paper and his paper is on pandemic as a disaster a theoretical uh it's not clear here a theoretical method of for exploring covid-19 uh, dr prachant khatri i think at this point of time he needs no introduction so please sir you start your presentation over to you thank you so much dr meenakshi and also professor sunita and also dr vipin and a very good afternoon to all the uh, people present in this uh, session and i am really glad to be presenting it in front of the august gathering today so uh, as uh, minakshi said that my uh, topic of presentation is pandemic as a disaster and i have been working on this field of disaster uh, for the past many years now and this present paper is actually a kind of an outcome of uh, three issues uh, that has come up during my seeing of this pandemic over the past one more than one year so the first one is that my um, association with this field of disaster studies and my readings of uh, uh, anthropology of disasters and the theoretical perspectives that uh, anthropologists and other social sciences scientists have been using to understand disasters the second uh, issue 
uh, uh, that informs this paper and is is behind the uh, behind producing this kind of a paper is the disaster management act 2005 Uh, which is presently being used as the cornerstone for administering the entire pandemic and also the epidemic diseases act of the 1897 that is largely being used by the state governments and the third issue that is important uh, in this paper is uh, a recent paper by shiva vishwanathan Uh, published in the economic and political weekly that says that covid-19 pandemic and the crisis of the social sciences so uh, this paper actually tries to bring in or is actually a product of these three parameters that forced me to write this paper because somewhere i was convinced the issues of disaster uh, or studies of disasters in the social science have to tell of, of the present pandemic so this paper is actually uh, divided into five sections first of all i will take up the cosmological explanation of the disasters and also of the pandemic how people see the pandemic and how this kind of an understanding helps the state to some kind of uh, Uh, from its or absolves the state from its responsibility and a kind of a moral political scenario emerges the second issue i will be dealing is the social contract in the context of a disaster the third is the patterns of war approach that has been used very widely to understand the pandemic and this actually is a, a is an outcome of the cold war era and actually an outcome of the studies of the disasters that were funded by the us during the cold war then the affective turn the affective turn in the disaster studies and how it informs the uh, how it informs the pandemic and also informs the issues of methodology for us and the last is the issue of death that we have to uh, see in the uh, present a uh, pandemic so uh, first i will take up the cosmological explanation and how this dwells into the realm of the moral political now it has been argued that the disasters are not about the dead they are about the living this is because the dead are gone but it is the people who are left behind have to deal with the pain and sufferings due to their loss they have to make sense of the situation and continue living damaged houses roads drainage system all can be built back and compensated but loss of the loved ones leaves scars that take considerable time to heal they also require explanations that may rationalize the loss in most common terms the pandemic from its very inception was defined as a metaphor for pralaya now within the judo christian religion the same can be translated as the end of the world this is a linear thought process in contrast to this in some philosophical mode of thinking creation and dissolution are cyclical processes with no end there is no disaster that can put the world to an end as there are only phases of creation and dissolution and no destruction now dissolution on the other hand happens due to the imbalances of the gunas within the prakriti now when seen from this perspective the pandemic can be visualized as an event that altered the way we live instead of bringing an end to this world the pandemic led to new ways of existence the theory of pralay also rationalizes the loss god is not held responsible for the disaster within this view individual and collective actions become important rallying points leading to the imbalance of the guna another doctrine that is the doctrine of karma becomes very important in making sense of the crisis a disaster therefore is not considered as an aberration or a purposeless happening but it is seen more as a moral judgment this idea of morality is also sometimes used by those who are entrusted with the task of managing the disasters it is in this context that disaster management moves into the realm of the moral political this is to say that the issue of morality in disaster works as a form of social control it also sometimes absolves the states of its responsibilities towards its citizens recovery from the disaster is an important phase in its management and within the moral political the recovery is entrusted solely upon the individual and the state absolves itself from its responsibilities 
most important outcome of the filter of karma is that it absorbs anger and frustration against the authority which is so common in a disaster situation a belief in karma works in favor of the state historically states were not welfare states and were only concerned with their revenue so historically states were not responsible for the management of disasters and this happened because of two reasons number one as i said that they were not welfare states and number two state and state machinery were also casualties in the disaster context however with the emergence of the conception of the welfare state state became a major stakeholder in disaster recovery and rehabilitation nonetheless the traditional narratives are still used in order to deflect the responsibilities now i come to the social contract in a pandemic and how there is a citizen state dyad that has to be located within the historical uh, dimension of making up of the citizenship now rights and entitlements form important components of citizens in a disaster context as it has been outlined by amartya sen and people in countries like usa refuse to follow government regulations as they were infringing upon their rights and entitlements although this might have resulted into increased infection but in comparison to this in india since people were unable to assert their rights they were subjected to all kinds of hardships in the form of large scale urban to rural migration moreover the front line workers like doctors nurses and the paramedics were not in a position to demand their dues from the government there were some agitation seen among some groups of doctors not getting their salaries on time and long working hours that they were subjected to but this could not get translated in any kind of right and their duties as doctors was weighed more against their rights as individuals this also suggests that the making of a political public is actually grounded in the local and national traditions citizenship then is the result of the larger socio political environment or precondition rather than something that is given in the context of a democratic polity so this kind of a pandemic is actually uh, raising important questions around citizenship now disasters are situations that are politically very sensitive this is to say that these situations have all the ingredients that may challenge the incumbent regime disasters may bring political instability and may erode the very basis of political power that is people's support the public very critically examine the role of state in dealing with disasters and organize to protest however the pandemic presented a very unique situation where protesting rights were suspended as a measure to avoid crowding during lockdowns studies have also suggested that vulnerabilities to disasters are more political issues rather than being technological now disasters therefore have the capacity to increase the political heat pre-existing political struggles are fed with increased inequalities on the basis of region class caste religion etc thus there is a reproduction of inequalities in a disaster context this conception however also has a flip side to it more often it is observed that politics and power are sustained through generating inequalities within the population in this context disasters or crisis may help in sustaining and reinforcing the dominant political narrative on which the ruling elite bases their political power in the absence of any strong opposition and a counter narrative the reproduction of inequality supports the incumbent regime disasters happening in some of the developed countries have shown that such situations of crisis allow the citizens to talk back with the people in power this feature however is contingent again upon the creation of the kind of political public in a socio historical context now i come to the third dimension that is the patterns of war approach now the pa- patterns of war approach to disaster has its emergence in the context of the cold war and the role of the united states in it Fritz has argued that during the Cold War, U.S. funded many research projects that were aimed at knowing the reaction of people in case there is an air strike in their area. In other words, reaction of people to external threat was being recorded through such projects. They wanted to know and test that how people will behave in the context of an external threat. Disaster research became an institutional demand during the war periods. an entire market for such research funding was generated in the context of the cold war 
people and areas affected by disasters like floods hurricanes or earthquakes were supposed to resemble victims of an air raid this approach was also instrumental in giving rise to the first kind of response to disasters in the form of recovery and rehabilitation as is done in the case of destruction caused by war the discourse on war tries to project an image of the state and of the administration that can resolve and tackle all kinds of human vulnerabilities it also gives scope for the emergence of iconic figures and martyrs who are supposed to have laid down their lives in the service of the country but philosophers and social scientists have questioned this approach to disaster i will discuss the critique through the work of a philosopher albert camu and a social scientist quarantelli Now, Camus was of the view that it is quite impossible to reduce all vulnerabilities to disasters, and especially he is talking in the context of plague. And the present pandemic is also a situation. Now, this is not a pessimistic view of disaster, but a view that is more nuanced. According to him, since we cannot tackle all the vulnerabilities, there, therefore, human beings must not behave in a way that is heroic. Instead, we must behave in a way that is more decent. heroism will give us a false hope that we are able to conquer all vulnerabilities which is actually not the case life according to him can be lived in a better way by not giving too much meaning to it now quarantelli on the other hand critiques the pattern of war approach through a concept of consensus crisis he is of the view that there is a consensus crisis in the war approach as it is mostly propounded and held by the ruling elite people on the ground however may not subscribe to the war rhetoric of the disaster there emerges a consensus crisis that questions the war rhetoric the pattern of war approach also assumes that there is a universal response to the crisis a response that remains some uh, that remains same across various groups and communities in a society this however is not the case the response to the crisis is constructed on the basis of past experience and available resources this way of looking at disaster is centered around the community and not around the external agent so i will also tell i will also add here that the patterns of war approach uh, believes that there is an external agent that is actually acting upon a population and that has to be dealt with however when we take up the uh, approach of vulnerability then it says that it all it is it is the case that it is the internal vulnerabilities within a population that are actually responsible for the disasters to happen or catastrophes to happen so within this context also we can criticize uh, this approach now i come to the affective turn in disaster studies uh, now uh, i'll just briefly define what i mean by the term affective they are feelings and emotions that cannot be structured in any language linguistic frameworks frameworks are not su sufficient to express such emotional feelings this happens more often in case of traumatic events such feelings remain at the individual level at the level of their bodies these feelings are termed as affective now sarbadhikari writes that recently scholars have initiated a new debate uh, with what is being called the affective turn in theory taking affective taking effective leaps from the work of deleuze and guattari and masumi they are trying to conceptualize sensory states at prelinguistic levels these non linguistic levels of the viscera like lightning flashes apprehends a temporal instance which the subject does not and even cannot anticipate these states thus overwhelm the experiences uh, experiences thought structure and supersedes their cognitive capacity affect in other words is a preconscious or better still supra conscious and supra subjective now this has important bearing this kind of an affective feeling which has no language is actually an important uh, has an important contribution towards the methodological issues in anthropological work now anthropologists are especially apprehensive 
about the future of anthropological field research in the context of social distancing. Anthropological field research involves participant observation and living with the community under study. In the wake of the corona crisis, however, there is a sense of suspicion and fear in the minds of people and are actively avoiding the outsiders. It needs to be seen that till what time such protocols and behavioral patterns are going to last. This may have some impact on the fieldwork of the individual and also of the team. However, I contend here that in the context of the affective turn in anthropology of disasters, now this is an important thing that I, uh, I want you to uh, note is that I contend here that in the context of the affective turn in anthropology of disasters, this corona crisis could be seen as every person's first-hand experience with the disasters, within quotes. Every person's first-hand experience with the disaster. I do realize, however, that this experience is not similar and uh, with all, uh, uh, and it is affected by categories of caste, class, gender, and other social groupings, but still it can be seen as an important turning point in the affective studies of disasters and doing affective ethnographies of the disaster events. Now I come to the last part Part of my presentation that is death and the pandemic. Uh, now, to understand that there are actually two uh, 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 theoretical perspectives. One is the functional and the other is the structural. There are also others. I will also talk about it. But I'm also reminded of Professor Vinay Srivastava and Kumkum Srivastava who wrote a paper on anthropology of death. And in that they contended that what death does by replacing old members in the society, it gives opportunities to the new members to enter into the shoes of their elders and take responsibilities of households and families. So this is more of a functional understanding. However, Within the French structuralism, one similarity, uh, one similarity among all cultures symbolizing death is that they all have some or the other rituals that are associated with it. Now, Robert Hurd's uh, has suggested that differences exist in terms of rituals and beliefs related to death in different cultures, but there is a similarity in the underlying logic. This logic is patterned on a triangular principle where the dead body the survivor and the place where the dead is supposed to have gone after death forms three points of a triangle. It is this triangular model of death that seems to be disturbed in this pandemic. The structural view says that this triangle is similar all throughout the cultures, but with this pandemic, this triangular structure seems to be disturbed. Although people are still quite sure about the place where their dead relatives have gone, but their relations with the corpse underwent a change. People were not allowed to see their dead ones for the one last time. They got apprehensive about the COVID infections that might be transmitted from the dead to the living. This resulted in a total institutional takeover of the disposal of the dead body. The pandemic has also altered and dented our conception about good death. A good death, quote unquote, has been conceptualized in a number of ways. From a biomedical conception that envisages the age at which a person dies to a more personal conception of painless death. Now, good death has always been celebrated, especially in the Indian context. This is actually an person dies only after completing all his or her duties towards family, friends, and relatives, and then dies a painless death. In the pandemic, however, people died at ages when they were not supposed to, and also they died painful deaths, both physically and socially. Now, once diagnosed with the disease, many were hospitalized to never return again and not to be seen by any member of their families. Besides this, death has never been a subject of overt discussion in houses, especially not in front of children who are considered to be too young to grasp the whole idea. Okay, who are considered to be too young to grasp the whole idea. There were a certain amount of decorum maintained while talking about death and the, uh, and the death by talking about the death and the dead, both in, both in linguistic terms where we never say that a person died, but only say that he or she passed away and in our body language also. However, the pandemic has brought the discussion of death and the dead in a very new and crude way to our discussions about it. A new kind of language, one which is, one which is also numerical and statistical in nature, suddenly emerged 
in our discussion now one last point i am going to make from the perspective of depth psychology of heroism becker has argued that we strive to be heroic because that is the only reasonable response to the terrible truth of mortality now a paradoxical discourse is what we heard and saw in the context of the pandemic there were actually two groups of people generating different discourses about it on the one hand there were people mostly the celebrities who said that being fearful is actually being heroic and then there were people who were actually working at the ground zero that is in hospitals ambulances as paramedics and other others labeled as frontline workers who were doing heroic deeds in the midst of the pandemic now there is actually a conflict seen between the cultural hero system and the mythical hero system now within the mythical hero system people try to serve the humanity in order to gain cosmic specialness now becker has seen this within the context of living in a creative illusion without knowing for sure about your permanent place in the cosmos now again within those religious philosophies where rebirth is an important theme deeds in the present birth becomes important to secure a better place in the future births also good deeds are believed to be leading unto salvation so uh, with this i come to an end of my presentation what i have actually tried to understand and tried to tell you is that Uh, disaster studies have given us certain um, perspectives through which we can see the present pandemic situation and also critique that what what whatever we have been seeing uh, through this i will end my presentation here and i will be very glad to receive your comments and questions on this thank you so much thank you dr prashant for your very in depth and insightful presentation and uh, you correctly described how perspective of disaster and disaster methodology particularly is helpful in dealing the pandemic situation and i uh, you also discussed the topic of death and pandemic which is very new to i think many of us has not even read or may, maybe it is a kind of taboo to deal or study the death things my, many of us my, might avoid this topic to to listen or to particular study so thank you thank you once again next presentation is from professor pr mondel sir he is going to talk on the effect of corona virus disease covid 19 on non human primates and probable way out a review welcome dr uh, thank you very much thank you very much i convey my thanks to the chair person professor sunita reddy ji dr bipin gupta and thank you very much for allowing me to do this i will show you and dr meenakshi thank you all now i will show you some slides you know the topic of my speech is the effects of corona virus disease 19 on non human primates and probable way out please let me say it it the accidental arrival of the corona virus disease 19 also abbreviated as covid 19 during december 2019 inside eu on city of hubei province of china is the cause of global pandemic situation in present days therefore from the even city of southern china this virus had spread quickly worldwide within 2 to 3 months after examining the taxonomy genetic similarities and phylogeny between the recently present virus and the virus which had effect of the severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus outburst 
during the year 2002 and 2003. It has been decided that the new virus will be called as SARS coronavirus 2. Since non human primate models will not help us to comprehend the viral disease biology of mechanisms and pathogenesis of SARS coronavirus 2, but also will assist to explain immunological, pharmacological, and toxicological aspects of the candidate vaccines and therapeutic approaches or strategies. The aim of the review is to show the effects of SARS coronavirus 2 in different non-human primate models and what are the possible remedies that can be applied to prevent this virus in the non-human primates. As the non-human primates have phylogenetic proximity with humans, so using those animals in biomedical research can be very valuable for knowing the characteristics and behavior of different viral diseases which affects human beings. Experimentally, non-human primates also can be contaminated by the coronavirus and can exhibit several symptoms that are visible in coronavirus affected human individuals. Experiments for the studying the clinical symptoms and behavior of coronavirus in non-human primates have primarily done worldwide on rhesus macaques, macaca mulata, and cyanomolgas macaque. According to the basic records, these monkeys after the infection on the first day, exemplify changes in the breathing process and also being escorted with pulmonary infiltrate, which linger for a minimum one week. Therefore, during this period, pneumonia-like fever occurs in human beings, which is a general symptom in humans. But in case of rhesus macaques, it becomes visible as a mild symptom or not yet monitored in this species. Thus, in some non-human primates, hematological alterations were identified, for example, neutrophila and leukocytosis, although within a few days, the value become normal, while experimental studies indicates that after the subsequent years of the outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome, related coronavirus during 2002 and 2003, lighter accounts of the symptoms were identified in the non-human primates that symptoms were observed in humans. During the first days of infection, researchers have detected similar things inside the oropharyngeal and nasal swabs of rhesus macaques like humans while talking about the positive effects of the coronavirus RNA. This incidence direct towards the high opportunity or chance for the spread of coronavirus, which can happen through the proximity existence with affected individuals or animals. It will be not possible to comment that coronavirus affected human individuals directly, which in fact the non-human primates or vice versa. Although the experimental research on viral cultures taking specimens from affected human individuals steadily point towards that SARS coronavirus 2 can obviously contaminate or infect the non-human primates. Lou et al. in 2020 conducted an experiment on three non-human primate species, namely Macaca mulata, Macaca pascularis, and one new world monkey, Calithrix jacus, to identify an appropriate non-human primate model for coronavirus 19. During this study, an increase in the temperature of the body, a decrease in body weight with abnormal chest radiographs were obtained from infected macaca mulata and macaca fascularis individuals. 
from all these animals, coronavirus genomes were identified from the blood and show of samples within the pulmonary tissues of macaca mulata and macaca vascularis. Viral load was identified, but this was not identified in Calithrix jacus. Among these three non-human primate species, only macaca mulata proved to be evident for most appropriate model for SARS coronavirus 2 because of enhancement of pathological changes and amplified inflammatory cytokine expressions within the pulmonary tissues of this species. In the study of Jing and others, they focused on interstitial pneumonia and virus shedding in the rhesus macaques identical to human being. They also detected local chemokine or cytokine changes in the respiratory tracts and T cell subjects, subsets, response in the lung tissues, which can be identified as the significant parameters for evaluation of triumphant animal model for SARS coronavirus 2. Adding together in the study of rocks and others on four cyanomolas macaques inoculated by SARS coronavirus 2 strain, serious nasal discharge was emitted in one aged individual on the 14th day of post inoculation and there were non-existence of overt clinical symptoms in all individuals. In this study, the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes were also identified, whereas there was severity in lung lesions by the 14th day of inoculation of the virus. All remaining individuals zero converted, which were revealed by the occurrence of SARS coronavirus to exact antibodies. Angiotensin converting enzyme 2 was discovered or determined as the receptor intended for SARS coronavirus and as well as has established or proven to be the receptor for SARS coronavirus 2 the phylogenetic contrast of ACE2 proteins permitted for predictions or calculations of species which were susceptible towards SARS coronavirus 2 viral infection. <coughs> Sorry. While taking about viral infectivity, ACE2 is a key or highly important determinant. Marine and others in 2020 have examined comparative ACE2 variation and COVID-19 risk or threat in the non-human primates in their study. Their study recommends that some lemurs, African and Asian monkeys and apes are possibly to be extremely susceptible towards coronavirus 2 rather than the American monkeys and some tertiaries, lemurs, and lorisoids. Studies on severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus and Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus depict that non-human primates can be used as good models for doing research on COVID-19 vaccines. In the study of Corbett and others, they have showed the assessment of mRNA 1273 vaccine in opposition to SARS coronavirus 2 in the non human primates, which ultimately gave them positive neutralizing results against the virus. For the process of drugs and vaccines against the pandemic coronavirus, these studies can be useful to direct and guide the scientists worldwide for maintaining the health of the non-human primates, specifically 
throughout the pandemic COVID-19 phase. It is essential for the veterinary doctors, zookeepers, and zoo employees, as well as primatologists who deal with non-human primates, mainly in laboratories, zoos, and parks where visitors come. It is their duty to acquire protective measures, precautions, and stay alert. Thus, we don't have much knowledge about SARS-CoV-2 disease, so the non-human primates will require veterinary care during the time of their infection. Additionally, there can be chance of infection into the unaffected non-human primates from the affected ones. So the veterinary and zoo management teams must be very prompt and aware in dealing these matters. The non-human primates are essential animal models for estimating medical opposed assesses in opposition to infectious viral diseases. Research macaques uncovered to SARS CoV virus 2 show infected and exhibit a mild or placid non lethal peeling viral disease phenotype. This comprises little to negative clinical surveillances. Thus, if clinical surveillances are accounted, they comprise mild dehydration, dyspnea, pyloerection tachypnea and reduced appetite. The infected research macaques, which are accounted, exhibited mild and transient fever starting shortly subsequent to exposure and recovering in two to three days. Though transient on temporary neutrophilia, lymphopenia, monocytosis, and leukocytosis were accounted in the infected research markups. Therefore, cyanomolgas macaques have been utilized for to examine the pathogenesis of SARS coronavirus, where elderly animals were more prone to extend the viral infections. When the cyanomolgas macaques are exposed or uncovered to SARS coronavirus 2, they came about infected. Although display no evident clinical symptoms or infections of disease. In several studies, it have been reported that the infected cyanomolgas macaques have a fever taking place on the day two to three of infection. Therefore, advanced levels of virus peeling or shedding were calculated in elderly or aged cyanomolgas macaques than the younger ones. The infected cyanomolgas macaques produced mild to moderate or reasonable lung abnormalities as well as microscopic lesions within the lungs counting alveolar edema alveolar and bronchiolar epithelial necrosis, accumulation or gathering of immune cells and hyaline membrane construction or formation. The African guinea monkeys uncovered SARS coronavirus 2 as young adult monkeys exhibit a mild and non-lethal shedding or peeling infectious disease phenotype which comprises little to negative clinical manifestations. Thus, if clinical surveillances like fever are accounted, they are normally temporary or transient and placid or mild with no severe expressions or manifestations. Infected African green monkeys expose transient and mild changes within leukocyte populations, selected or certain liver enzymes, and mild thrombocytopenia. During the early stage in infection in African green monkeys, a measure or an assess of acute or severe inflammation is raised or elevated. 
the global increase of spread of the new SARS coronavirus 2 and their recent mutants, quick transmission and severity or harshness of the viral disease have made the development or expansion of vaccines and therapeutics which are the urgent priorities in the current world scenario. Hence, COVID-19 is a multifactorial, multifaceted, multi-systemic and a highly infectious viral disease which reminds us widespread or existence reactions or response in, in, in the human beings. Therefore, no single non-human primate model is sufficient or can be summarized to understand the complete pathogenesis of SARS coronavirus 2, like in humans. With the response or reaction to other rising or emerging viral infections, non-human primate models can be utilized for playing key role or responsibility even when candidate vaccines and therapeutics have emerged globally at a record level. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for finishing it well on time. Even I say it is before time. And thank you for presenting very interesting on very interesting topic. Interesting in the sense that this is the time when we are still struggling to know about coronavirus and its impact on human, human being. When and how it is going to mutate, its mutant variety is going to come, when second phase, third phase is going to come, which medicine is going to work, which medicine is not going to work. So we are still in the research phase and it is very unpredictable. At this point of time, the study on non-human and primate came and it is very important. I think it will also help uh, in uh, future for the biomedical research also. And you have very well discussed about the remedies to prevent the SARS-CoV-19 among non-human primate. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Next. Hello? Yeah. Sunita, ma'am? No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, we have to take the question at the last of the session, no? Yeah, because think... still now there is no question in the chat box. Right. So uh, okay. participants can put their questions in the chat box. We'll take okay. up all the questions in the end. So I would like to call the next presenter, N. Kiran Maladevi. And she's going to present on COVID-19 and maternal health, short and long-term implications. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Minakshi. Uh, uh. Vinit, can you please share the slide? Yes, ma'am, I'm sharing. Yes. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, the whole session is revolved around COVID-19. And uh, I'm very happy to hear from Professor Mondel about the primates and COVID-19, and uh, also Pasan Khatri on the COVID-19 pandemic. And also, it was very uh, useful information. So now let's look at uh, how the COVID-19 have affected on maternal, especially on maternal health. So um, my presentation, the overview of my presentation will be talks in terms of the long-term presentation and the short-term uh, uh, short term implication and the long-term implication. So in the short-term implication, uh, what I will do is I will discuss on the direct and indirect effect and the long term I'll discuss about in two dimension. One is epigenetics, one is do head. So uh, let's start with our uh, uh, discussion. 
So uh, when we were writing this manuscript and submitted to the uh, for the publication in honor of our beloved Professor Joshi, uh, that time we were not very much into uh, review of second wave because second wave is still happening. So the whatever the information we have gathered and in, put in that manuscript was on basically on first wave and SARS and Mars. But now since the second wave is very visible and it's witnessed by all of us. So I thought in the slide, we will try to give little uh, insight about the second wave also. So if you look at uh, the SARS on metanin health, uh, it is found that in publication in the, in the evidences we have uh, flooded in the internet, what we have is the metanin that miscarries intrauterine growth restriction and the preterm delivery. These are most of the, uh, the cases associated with uh, infection, SARS infections. And if you talk about Mars, the metronin death, um, uh, premature deliveries, intensive care treatment of the newborn and peri perinatal death was immersed in the Mars. And in 2009, uh, in COVID-19, sorry, the first wave, uh, it was very um, evidence that very limited effect was on uh, maternal health. The pregnancy and the newborns, there was not very least affected. But in the second wave, uh, I could see many evidences talking about uh, affecting on pregnant women. And that infection was uh, very from uh, one from mild to moderate and even severe infection. And the death was also reported in, in many cases. So uh, let's come to direct effect of COVID-19 and pregnancy. So what we have learned from the first wave. So in the first wave, uh, the clinical characteristic of COVID-19 in pregnant women are similar to those who reported of pregnant, non-pregnant adult patients. The older symptoms were reported to be quite similar, but the no evidence of intrauterine infection was there. And uh, there was no evidence of um, uh, the, the transmission, vertical transmission in the women who developed COVID-19. And another thing which is also reported is the amniotic fluid, cord blood, neonatal throat swab, and the breast milk samples were tested for SARS-CoV-2, and all the samples were test, tested and negative for the virus. So these are some of the direct effects which we can see from the first wave. So what are the observation and possible explanation for that? The impact of COVID-19 on pregnancy outcomes are less as we have discussed, it is less and severe and not less severe. And it is reported very less in SARS and MERS. But the impact of COVID-19 on newborn babies are also very less in both the cases. But in, in COVID-19, the mortality which we compare from SARS to MERS and in COVID-19, the, the, if you see the, the percentage of maternal death, it is very less. It is very less in COVID-19. In fact, it's one to three percent only. So if we talk about, so there are so many things beyond the infection. There are so many things going on beyond the infection. The viral infection affecting our body, which is direct, whether it's affecting the lungs, it's affecting the other organs in the body, it is, it is there and it is, it is quite evident if we see any kind of TV channel, any kind of social media, you'll see all these evidences of affecting people seriously, you know, severe condition of infection of COVID-19. But there are many um, dimensions. Uh, please go back to that slide. Please go back to slide. Huh? There are many dimensions. In the sense that there are lots of, uh, you know, unspoken health condition in that. That is maternal health, uh, maternal, um, maternal health on mental health issues. So early data suggests that the pregnant women are experiencing more severe illness in the second wave. Okay. And there are more, many reports talking about the deaths of uh, the pregnant women's 
and the sudden increase in maternal death has reported from various part of country. I have seen uh, there are uh, studies from Kerala, there are studies of from other states where the maternal death is reported uh, in the COVID-19 infection. But, but still, there are very limited literacies. The literacies are not at all available because it's, it, it may be because the, the phase is still going on. So in just wait for another one or two months, I think we will have enough uh, literature on that. So these are some of the uh, evidences or some of the you know, sort of publication we found out from, from the media. And uh, there is no proper research um, as such uh, to give you some insight that these are the reported from the, the news, different types of newspapers. Next. So uh, let's come down to the indirect uh, effect of COVID-19 and frequency. There are many indirect methods. So the direct method, we can see it from mild to moderate to severe. And if we can see from SARS to MERS, that so due to the healthcare infrastructure, it may get, get overwhelmed. So according to Robertson in 2020, there will be 45% reduction in maternal and child health service in next six months, the leading to one um, 11 lakhs, 57,000 child death and 56,700 maternal death. This implies that 8, 9.8% to 44.7% increase in, is under five death rate per month. So 8.3 to 38.6% increase in maternal death per month. So these are some of the effects which we can see it from uh, COVID-19 infection pandemic. So force in 2020 highlights that the children are at the risk, not only for the infection, but also from the losing caregivers, the mothers and children are affected by the disruption of essential supports and supply, constrained access to clinic, schools, social workers, water sanitation in particular threat to women. And this is, we have seen it, we have seen in the second wave. Many children are of orphan because that both the parents were, uh, you know, because of the COVID-19. They have lost both the parents. So we have seen a lot of this kind of news everywhere in, in any form of social media. Besides us, when we can talk about is the supply chain is totally disturbed. There is no supply chain of food. There are many, say, for, for uh, the, those who are uh, middle income economic uh, status or higher economic status can, you know, just order the food and do not go out from the house. And you will have a salary or your income in your, in your bank account every month. And you can order anything, you know. So you don't need to go out. So, and your, your supplies is not disturbed. You will have your food supplies every day in your house, fruits, vegetables, whatever it is, it will be there. But if you think about the people or children who are, whose parents are laborers, okay, they have to earn every day wages. And those people are really suffering because of this distribution in supply chain. Not only that, even the water, they have a poor sanitation, uh, access to the uh, water and poor sanitation. And not only that, in, in many places, in many places where the pregnant ladies where we're supposed to have a good nutrition, you know, fruits, vegetables has to be there in their daily diet. So because of the lockdown, there are very less possibility of getting the nutrient food by the pregnant ladies. So when they are not consuming sufficient food or balanced diet, and obviously there is an effect in the fetus at the same time at the health of the woman. And I have I have lots of example in this. When I was talking to some of the pregnant ladies in my hometown, they were saying that before the lockdown, I used to have every day one apple and one banana, you know. But when the lockdown imposed and there is no supply of fruits in the market because nobody is there in the market because of the lockdown, so I stopped eating fruits for last two months. So these kind of issues are coming up. These are, uh, you know, affecting the mother at the same time, the fetus. So uh, 
As reported by AXA et al. in 2002, the sector like food system was we discussed, incomes, social protection, healthcare services for women and children. And this I can talk about the, the Indian government also, in, in India also, the immunization have reduced. Most of the resources were diverted either to the COVID or the women and children are so scared to go to the healthcare system to avail their uh, immunization service. So there are reduction in children's immunization. At the same time, there's a reduction of, you know, healthcare uh, routine checkup of the pregnant ladies. They're so scared to visit any healthcare because of the COVID-19, because the COVID-19 infection. So there was a reduction of service uh, by the beneficiaries, both mothers and the children. And, and the hostile circumstance like insecure economic condition, since there's a lockdown, the, the, the income suddenly stops and the restricted travel, there is no access, there is no vehicle to travel around, you know, to go to the, the doctors or any, any, any healthcare centers. So, and then delay the vaccination because people are so scared to go. Even I delay two months of my daughter's vaccination. So is the is, is, is reality is that. And then um, education, obviously the schools are closed and those who have smartphones and computer at home, they can easily conduct their classes. But those who are in the rural areas and the very low socioeconomic status, how they are doing their classes. So there are uh, indirect, if, uh, affecting indirectly to the whole society. So next slide. So these are some of the psychological implications of COVID-19 on maternal health. And this is a, one of the most important, you know, um, silent indicator of long-term health effect because it's an every individual, okay? It's an every, every individual or each and every woman are suffering from some kind of deflation or anxiety because of COVID-19 pandemic. You know, even we are so, so is, you see, I mean, anybody comes to my house, uh, we are tense and anybody come for the service, service, AC servicing also for, for one week, we have so tense that whether that man has, you know, a COVID positive or not. So everybody is so tense, anxiety at the same time, depression, because depression is as such because, uh, because of the lockdown, say we, um, we go to the workplace and we interact with the friends, suddenly it stops. So you are confined in your house. Access is totally disturbed. Access to every uh, domain is totally disturbed. So there is anxiety also. So who is getting positive? My neighbor is getting positive. My, my friends are getting positive. People around me is getting positive. My family members are getting. So anxiety is all the time. So how it is affecting the health of the woman at the same time, if the woman, woman is pregnant, then how it is indirectly affecting the fetus. So this, these are the, some of the points which need to ponder around, okay? So mental stresses like, you know, increased, re, this, this kind of stresses are very much associated. And it is already uh, lots of, uh, uh, you know, uh, publications are there. There also evidences are there. The stresses like depression and anxieties has increased the risk of preterm delivery and also reduced the mother-infant bonding, you know? And it's because the mother will be depressed. So there is reduction in that, you know, bonding between the mother and infant. And there is a delay in cognitive and emotional, you know, uh, development of the infant which persists till childhood and which may also have a long implication when the, if, if we follow the children up to their adulthood or later life, you know? So there are many, you know, many, many dimension which we can run, uh, look around, uh, which are indirect, very silent, but in after some time, it will have implication on our livelihood. Thus it can be conducted that the indirect socioeconomic psychological impact of COVID-19 on maternity and child health can be more widespread as a critical in both short and long run that impact the occurrence of COVID-19 infection during the, the pregnancy. Next slide, please. So uh, here I would like to talk about the long-term implication that of, of the COVID-19. So if, you, if we see the characteristic of early development that is in utero or even before, 
can represent a major risk for a lifetime of physical and mental health problem. I mean, it, it, these are the published data. This is, this is from the evidence we found it from the publication, okay? So this is nothing I have, you know, frame or something like that, it is there. So according to development and origin of health and disease, hypothesis proposed by Basker, it says that environment in which the individual finds himself during his early development, that is preconceptual in utero or early postnatal period may have important consequences in his health during his other life. So there are many cohort studies available internationally. You know, many people have done this. Even in India, have we? Uh, in, in even in India, we have a cohort for this. Okay. So there are many studies uh, uh, understanding uh, how the you know the environment, the the fetus was is affecting the later stages of life, especially on health. Not just this prenatal exposure to the mental and stress can also increase the risk for behavior and mental health problems in later life. So these are some of the facts available in science, okay? These are some of the facts available in science and why we're discussing this because now it's an every individual is going through risk. Individuals who are pregnant in this pandemic at this point of time is going to address. So we are, uh, we should, we should definitely look or understand and research, okay, more into this and try to solve some of the problems which may develop in the later stage of life. The example of stresses during pregnancy include nutrition and stress because nutrition, nutrition is uh, very important when <coughs> lady is pregnant or lactating. So nutrition stresses, both under and over nutrition metabolic disorder, exposure to environment and toxicants and maternal immune activation and provoked by the infection. Because uh, during this pregnancy, uh, we are, the women who are pregnant are already compromising their immunity. Okay, because of certain sense of physiological and hormonal changes. So in that period of time, if you get infection, the infection can be severe. Okay, so in the United States, the old pregnant ladies and electric mothers are vaccinated. But India, recently, uh, I think the announcement was made for the electric mothers. So now many bodies, Foxy, Okay, all India Gynecologists Association, FOXI, and many, many others, uh, medical associations and, and technical, technical expert of immunization are proposing for the pregnant mothers, uh, pregnant ladies and late mothers. New evidence are also showing that the maternal, <coughs> sorry, psychological distress as well as stress from exposure to life event and natural disaster during the pregnancy gives rise to behavior and mental health problems. This is the studies there is 2017, banned then. So the exposure to perinatal stresses induce the senses of fetus such as, uh, uh, yes. Sorry to disturb, I think two more minutes. Yes, yes. I think uh, I'm going to end in another one or two slides, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Ah, the, so the, uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, this is the important slide and after this I will end, okay. The study of survivors of dust hunger winter and Holocaust, their offspring, uh, offspring across the generation have revealed the range of physical and mental health consequences, okay. And the winter in nine, winters of 1994 to 1995, a period of six months is known as the hunger winter and in Netherlands. And here, the pregnant ladies in that period of time, okay, and they follow and retrospectively understanding the, 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 the babies born uh, who are pregnant at that time, who are in fetus uh, born, and they follow up and they, they could see many, <coughs> many uh, phenotypes like Type 2 diabetes were high among them, cardiovascular diseases were high among them, and associated cognitive decline was also there. Next slide, please. Um, 
So the epigenetic carries with, with the notion of memory of development in event. Epigenetic is nothing but the DNA. When we talk about DNA, it changes. But epigenetics, uh, the DNA, it doesn't change. But epigenetics, uh, the expression of genes, it, it is decided. It's, it gives a signature, the genes plus the environment. So environment is very important for epigenetics. The epigenetic carry notion of mem memories of development in event. When the initial stimulus has disappeared, therefore it must be considered a key mechanism of the head. It has been observed in minor alterations. So this, this, this is whole uh, underlying uh, message of this presentation as uh, is this, the epigenetics impact uh, due to COVID-19 infection and pregnant ladies and lactating mothers even the the, uh, the the women's should be follow up and understand the long term implication. So I think I would like to end my uh, slide here. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for this very very in depth presentation. I think it's also an eye opener for all of us. While I was I or many uh, of us were listening to the long-term implications of the coronavirus on maternal health. So it's, an, it's truly an eye-opener for us. And uh, you also discussed some short-term implications on maternal health, as well as uh, you compared the maternal health from, uh, uh, from the first wave to the second wave also, where in the first wave, it was less severe with limited impact. And we can see in the second wave, so many deaths and maternal uh, health has been compromised thereafter its impact on children is obviously it's visible so thank you ma'am for your presentation now mm, the last presenter of this session i would like to invite uh, suniti yada she is going to talk on covid-19 pandora box the current scenario science and social science of vaccine uptake Welcome, Dr. Suniti. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, I would request the host to kindly allow us a uh, screen share. You're the co-host, you can always, yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Minakshi, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sunita Reddy. And thank you to the Department of Anthropology for this um, uh, seminar. So I'll start with uh, my presentation on the topic COVID-19 Pandora box. Uh, since uh, the current scenario of COVID-19, it's an amalgamation of fears and uh, the uh, fears and overcoming them. Uh, so it is a Pandora box that is uh, revolving around the science and social science about the science of the infection, the uh, social science of uh, cure and isolation, the science of vaccine and the social science of vaccine uptake, reluctance and refusal. So in the current scenario, if we see all, uh, more than uh, 169 million cases have been reported uh, to WHO as on uh, yesterday and um, Almost 4 million deaths have already occurred across the, uh, across the different countries. Almost 206 countries have been affected uh, by COVID-19. And uh, this virus has caused a lot of damage in terms of, uh, in terms of direct death due to infection. And also the post-infection uh, post mortality and morbidity is happening, which is still unaccounted for in the number of deaths. So this virus is going to take a lot from us and um, uh, currently nobody knows as to when it would end and how it would end. So when we talk about the current situation in uh, Southeast Asia, almost 3.1, uh, 31 million cases are uh, already there and uh, we are experiencing the second wave. So I'll also talk about uh, the waves and the stages of COVID-19 pandemic, which all of us know, but then uh, I would take, across, uh, take you across the stages of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So the important thing here is 
uh, most of the countries have been uh, uh, undergoing the second wave as uh, my uh, as my uh, senior colleagues have already stated that cosmology uh, it uh, okay so as uh, my senior colleagues have already stated that uh, we are already uh, surpassing through the second uh, stage and um, the countries are experiencing the second stage at different stages different time periods so the in uh, indian situation uh, we have a lot many cases already there and uh, 2.7 million cases and um, with even more deaths uh, with um, 3.2 lakh deaths uh, with that have been reported to WHO. Now, if we see here the cases, the cases first rise in a steady manner. They reduce it. They do not. They never go down to zero. And then again, exponential. They start increasing, wherein a certain section of population is infected, and after that, the numbers start reducing. However, the number of deaths occurring during this course, they do not go in a similar fashion they are somewhat lagging behind the actual infection rate because the deaths happen after the infection and maybe three to four days after the infection or maybe even after seven days so the effect of death comes afterwards so in the overall uh, view of covid19 pandemic as this pandemic is evolving we have a lot of challenges and there are distinct questions that were not really present during the earlier epidemics that the world has faced. Uh, the most important is about the um, production of the vaccine, uh, which was definitely at a much faster rate. In one year, we could come up with almost six to seven candidate vaccine providers, of which uh, three are already in place and one is uh, another one is almost about to come. So, uh, and the other fact was Regarding the vaccine refusal, despite the need for vaccine uptake, there has been a significant vaccine hesitancy and vaccine refusal rate, which causes vaccine wastage. So I'll uh, take you across the stages of uh, the uh, pandemic, but in the, the stage one, there's an unknown virus which, is, uh, which emerges and uh, it only infects a few people or maybe in a particular set of area. So that is where the stage one is. Then slowly the infection is spread to, and uh, the origin is probably from the animal source only. Uh, and uh, then it spreads to, then there is human transmission from the animals. So from uh, when, the, uh, when it is transferred to, transmitted to humans, the next stage is human to human transmission. If it is uh, human to human transmission, then there is a breakout of the disease. Now, if the infection rate is pretty high, it leads to the pandemic state. And uh, pandemic stage is when uh, it is reported in more than one WHO covered region. So this is what how this is how uh, WHO defines it. Uh, so at stage two, the pandemic unfolds; it starts uh, spreading across the globe, and uh, maybe the infectivity rate is different. Maybe it could be similar. So this is how a, a pandemic evolves. The next stage is the pandemic would actually accelerate. So in this stage, the number of infections would steadily increase. The deaths would also increase. In the stage four, the, it is a multifaceted uh, pandemic. And during this course, obviously all continents or all the countries would not experience the same flow uh, at the same time. The last is when the medical uh, countermeasures are already available. Uh, the vaccines have been developed and other measures are already taken care of. The next is, uh, the first stage is the initial response to the virus. If we see this, um, if we see this, uh, it was on 11th of March. Uh, the first cases were reported in around uh, early November in China. And, it, it, uh, and in India, the first case was on 3rd of January. And... Uh, on 11th of March, the uh, pandemic was declared, uh, the uh, COVID-19 infection was declared as a pandemic across the world by WHO. So, uh, uh, and uh, then uh, the strategic preparations had already started in by February. And uh, then public health emergency of international concern was, uh, was, um, was uh, reported by WHO. And slowly, uh, as and when the um, uh, progression of the disease happened, uh, it was uh, it was uh, measures were taken 
as in uh, the social measures were taken and uh, the um, uh, medical resources were pulled in and uh, then the ways to tackle the pandemic were there now after this uh, in the stage one only then research for diagnostic vaccines and therapeutics began immediately after it was reported as an outbreak so if we talk about uh, the uh, ebola outbreak the who adopted a plan therein so because of that plan an a blueprint was created and in this a strategy for rapid action for the development of um, vaccines diagnostics and therapeutics was was undertaken during this outbreak and the first uh, global meeting about the covid-19 vaccination and uh, research innovation was in february so it took almost uh, since the outbreak it still took two months for who to you know come into that stage and um, uh, pool uh, pool up resources across the world the next is this stage 2 which are in the pandemic unfolds it goes in simultaneously and the uh, the uh, cases go on increasing uh, across the world so this was in march 12 where in most of the countries across the world were affected and in and during this stage only the pandemic spread outside china and people had started putting in travel bans people had started uh, uh, reducing the uh, reducing the meetings the crowded places and uh, already the preventive measures in terms of uh, in terms of society that is the uh, social distancing or the physical distancing and um, washing hands and uh, keeping hygiene all these things had already kept uh already started we are um, taking up masks and everything now the four scenarios of covid-19 response are one where in no covid response covid cases are reported then there are sporadic cases cluster of cases and community transmissions now we already know that most of the countries have already uh, already gone into the community transmission stage wherein there is a wide spread of the disease and uh, it is difficult to control at a particular air and then it goes into an airborne state covid-19 pandemic has already crossed all these stages and we are into the airborne stage now covid-19 when it leads to it goes into the community transmission stage when there uh, when there are no measures to have a check on the rate of infection the infections would rise and our health system have a particular capacity any health system for uh, even for the developed nations and even for the uh, developing nations so if the measures are taken as in say physical distancing as in say masks so the curve can be flattened so capacity of the health system can be exceeded if there are too many people who seek healthcare at the same time this was what had happened in the peak uh, during the this uh, uh, early earlier this month and the last month so this was what had, what we all had experienced and uh, in the uh, next stage in the uh, in the same stage in implementation of public health and social measure measures are already done the pandemic accelerates so after the first uh, initial acceleration is there in the stage 2 only the pandemic accelerates and then uh, we undergo the uh, waves which could be single which could be multiple and which could be two waves three waves so depending on the infection and the control and control of spread so the first wave it goes down obviously with protective measures we can flatten the curve flatten the second curve but considering the entire global situation in uh, covid-19 pandemic we saw there was a steep rise in the cases in infect, uh, infectious cases compared to the first first wave deaths were even more than the first wave so this is somehow which has been um, which this is the story that has that is still unfolding right now in covid-19 scenario now uh, multiple uh, peaks uh, have been uh, multiple peaks have been uh, seen in terms of previous intense outbreaks and ebola outbreaks and uh, we are yet to experience the uh, covid-19 how it would unfold further the next stage is the medical countermeasures and wherein we already have the uh, vaccines and india is india has administered uh, already uh, uh, 2 million uh, vaccine doses and which is one of the largest vaccination drives across the world now coming on to the vaccine effectiveness now 
in indian context a multidisciplinary approach is required now india was the first country to launch a massive vaccination drive and despite that uh, we are one of the countries wherein a lot of vaccine wastage is happening and um, majority of the state uh, and majority of the states are into the state of vaccine wastage despite having uh, vaccine sufficiency in initial stages and even now uh, so in indian context a multidisciplinary approach has uh, has to be put in place to to reduce uh, to reduce this vaccine wastage now when we start with uh, the vaccines we already know the vaccines have been effective the uh, polio has been er eradicated from india smallpox has been eradicated from india and uh, the uh, child immunization programs we already know and uh, diseases such as rubella diphtheria dpt and all this they are now less common so we know that vaccines are effective but the only thing that is required now is in covid 19 scenario is the community engagement activities wherein we can directly engage communities we can increase the vaccine acceptance reduce vaccine hesitancy so that people have a confidence in vaccines and the effectiveness of vaccines and thus the vaccine wastage is reduced and the key words here would be vaccine confidence once we have confidence in the vaccine effectiveness the effect the acceptance by the communities is there of course uptake increases and hesitancy is reduced however this a uh, vaccine effectiveness is sometimes a self destructive model i'll further explain as to how and why now uptake of vaccine when we talk about uptake of vaccine the vaccine decision is generally based on the knowledge attitude and beliefs about the vaccine now if the knowledge is less obviously the decision for vaccine uh, vac vaccine wastage is there if our attitude towards the vaccination program and our vaccination program is different we will not have a, a, a sufficient vaccine uptake now the belief in the vaccine has to be there if, and which is a community which is at the community level now vaccine vac vaccination programs are self destructive at, in in this scenario that the more the vaccination happens it is expected that Uh, adverse outcomes or contraindications do happen which is which generally happen which normally happens in case of all the vaccines even when we talk about the polio vaccines one in almost 1 lakh 1 uh, lakh children is bound to be affected is expected to be affected by polio so which doesn't mean that uh, any vaccine doesn't have a risk all the vaccines have their own set of risks so as in when the vaccination program or the vaccination drive expands the contraindications or the adverse effects are reported and therefore if it if the uh, if the um, uh, adverse effects are reported in in a much larger scale by the people based on their knowledge due to their uh, misinformation then the vaccine dis vaccine uh, program faces self destruction as to the uptakers are reduced hesitancy again increases now there is a need for support for the health policy and health communication and awareness among the non vaccinated non vaccinated people now to change the vaccine vaccine decision these things are important health communication and the science behind vaccine has to be uh, explained to the common people to the communities in their own perspective they should understand it rather than Uh, being uh, a purely mrna based vaccine or a or a vaccine that needs cold storage you know they need to be explained as to how it would work and what all you can benefit it from now it is also a cultural phenomenon and it encompasses religious beliefs family choice which is an important factor which uh, i experienced in my own family i had to convince really hard um, uh, i had to convince my parents really hard and then when they own sibs were going in for vaccination they immediately agreed despite me explaining the benefits of uh, vaccination now kin choice belief system or the community beliefs are important uh, community beliefs here and i would uh, cite an example of polio wherein um, wherein there was a drive against um, polio vaccination vaccines in nigeria and that was the first one later on came in london and uh, in certain pockets of india also now uh, in nigeria it so happened that uh, people had started uh, started um, 
refusing uh, vaccine uptake, polio vaccine uptakes. And in certain cases, a certain pockets of Uttar Pradesh, by a, but one particular uh, religious group, people who um, who practiced one particular uh, religion, they also uh, they also did not take up vaccines. Now, when anthropologists uh, got involved in it, they first understood the vaccine hesitancy and the reasons for the vaccine vaccine refusal, and that is how where uh, the religious belief had come up. Uh, there were recent reports about a particular community uh, that they think or they believe that vaccines they contain uh, they contain um, materials that are derived from uh, uh, pig fat and which is not considered uh, pure in that community and hence they would refuse vaccines. Now that is where science behind the vaccine vaccines has to be uh, has to be explained to them. At the same time, there was certain section of the sim, uh, uh, certain section of people from the same community who also told, who also uh, explained that if the vaccines are so important, these areas, these areas can be uh, these uh, minor uh, things wherein which go against the religion slightly, they can be considered and um, and hence vaccines can be taken up. Now. While the epidemic wave has a strong component of time and space, we are all seeing we had first wave, then we are, we are experiencing second wave. The involvement of anthropology is important and it is important to bridge that particular gap between the healthcare providers, the policy makers, the researchers who are purely into science uh, creation and, pro, um, and uh, providing the science, uh, the uh, facilities based on science and the communities, which is common people. So anthropology can bridge in this gap. So there, is a there is a need for coordinated approach between the healthcare providers and the communities. Now, the people's risk assessment behavior towards the understanding of science behind the vaccines has to be shifted. Now, the next is awareness of plausible threat to health, which needs to be communicated to people. You have to educate the target population, which involves which involves uh, form, uh, which involves common people and people who are non-vaccinated. Disseminate the information about the severity as to what could be the level of severity if they're not vaccinated. Risks and effectiveness of vaccine uptake. Now, in terms of this entire spectrum, wherein hesitancy is there, refusal or rejection is there then acceptance by the community is there, which increases uptake. Anthropology tries to understand these drivers in terms of actual cultural, social, and political settings. Now, what anthropologists do is, even in case of polio, this was done, and therein, in those uh, pockets of Uttar Pradesh, again, vaccination drive for polio could be increased. So, anthropologists, they listen to the community or beliefs of the people, and their concerns, perceptions towards the particular disease, and how it is how the vaccine is uh, is um, playing an important role in the uh, in the entire uptake scenario in, in the entire uptake spectrum. The next is they understand the reasons for their concerns. If it has to be say uh, pig fat, then that is understood. If there is something else, say for example, in uh, when when we talk about Uttar Pradesh. When the polio vaccination drive was being done by people who were coming outside from the community or from the region or, or the state, people told once they would vaccinate and they would leave the area. If something happens or maybe an adversity happens to our child in, in case of polio. So if that happens, we do not know whom to report to. So this is how this entire scenario has to be understood. The next is indulgence of anthropologists between uh, to create a dialogue, to initiate a dialogue between the community and the stakeholders in with the policymakers. Then create methods of intervention. Say uh, in polio, uh, the again the large scale vaccination drive happened, but in this case, instead of vaccine going to the people which was initially done because door to door surveillance and you know vaccination drive it takes a lot of money and manpower and uh, burdens the health system again uh, people went to the vaccines 
so it was a mass vaccination but the method was created that camps were organized and a community awareness was done ic activities were done so that people used to take the children to the vaccination center so this reduced the efforts of manpower this reduced the cost and the method was uh, innovative now the Something, next is to that uh, sorry to disturb you uh, one yeah, i'm almost uh, almost in the end ma'am yeah yeah the next Actually, is to so recognize that i was uh, Okay, okay, I'm almost, uh, this is almost the, towards the end. Mm -hmm. Next is to understand and uh, to recognize the efforts of community and who can do what. So this is how it is supposed to happen. If we know a community religious leader can, you know, uh, can uh, change the behavior of the community, we need to take them into account. If we know that a school principal can uh, change the behavior of a particular uh, uh, community members or maybe a group of people, we need to involve them. So the miscommunication about information and or the infodemic. So it is more a COVID-19 pandemic has been more about infodemic rather than, you know, pandemic currently. So this curve needs to be flattened and this information, the right information has to reach the people about the disease, about the infection, about the deaths and about the vaccines about the contraindications in the vaccine, about the adversities of the vaccine. So uh, in, uh, a world famous immunization expert, Dr. Larson, who was also involved in the polio vaccination program, and now she is in UNESCO, and uh, who's also uh, doing this COVID, um, uh, the, sorry, the vaccine, uh, vaccine confidence project across the globe. So she states that in one of her statement that India should build COVID-19 vaccine confidence Identify hesitancy hotspots. Say, for example, if the wastage is high, is very high in Rajasthan, in certain areas of Rajasthan, that has to be reduced. So, identify the hotspots and reduce this hesitancy by right intervention. So, they can anthropologists can bridge this gap by developing methods to communicate the need for vaccine and to strategize the reduction in vaccine wastage. So with this, I would uh, end with my presentation, and I think, uh, and I would, uh, I would request all those who have not been vaccinated to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suniti. Uh, just like your presentation, your topic of presentation was also very much interesting. The Pandora box, COVID nineteen, a Pandora box. It is truly a Pandora box. Day to day basis, we are getting new information coming out, new do's and don'ts are coming out. So. And the whole story of the COVID-19 corona virus, you have explained through your presentation, through five stages, how coronavirus emerged and it is spread out and how people in different countries respond to it and what are the medical measures, med medical countermeasures. And also you talked about the effectiveness of vaccine and more importantly, the role of anthropologists in it. I think it is very important the role of anthropologist, the very definition of anthropology, the time and space you have correlated with that also. Thank you. I think, ma'am, we can take up the questions for all the from all the presented presentations. Okay. Thank you, that. Thank you, Dr. Meenakshi, for uh, coordinating the whole session very well. Uh, we don't have much time. It's almost 3.40. I think we have to wind up at 3.45 because the valedictory is at 4 o'clock. We should give a 15 minutes break. Uh, but then uh, I really enjoyed listening to all the four speakers, starting from Prashant's uh, uh, understanding of COVID, especially theoretically, and also bringing in the politics behind the disasters. Again, uh, Professor Mondrell's uh, presentation on uh, primates is uh, very revealing because we are all focused on humans, but then non-humans, primate, and their infection and how to safeguard. That's another very important area which physical anthropologists have been looking at and, and uh, one of the important areas to also intervene, uh, especially when you look at pandemics like this. Again, uh, Dr. Kiran Mala's uh, paper was very, very interesting, looking at maternal health and how we, COVID has impacted much more in the second wave. And we are still worrying about the third wave, and especially which is going to take toll on the children, uh, looking at the examples from the other countries. And of course, uh, Suniti's presentation on immunization and the infodemic 
uh, when you look at i think corona is the time when each and everybody after a month or two started uh, you know discussing and deliberating on covid in all sectors whether it's education health uh, when you look at uh, the labor each and every department each and every institution is looking at uh, from their own disciplinary you know, uh, angle on corona and how it is impacting each of it but the point is uh, this is very exists i mean uh, the whole issue is very existential and we need to really understand uh, the human beings as anthropologists always look at humans and are we able to give answers given the complexity given the pandemics which is so uh, confusing at times uh, what we are uh, planning to do and uh, some of the questions which have come in and especially when you viva is asking whether you no know, uh, why is it government not taking the you know, advice or scientific advice but then uh, that that is another challenge within the country where you see that there is not much of interactions between the academicians and the policy makers so those are the you know gaps which needs to be bridged and of course as uh, sumiti also said that uh, these are the things which anthropologists can do if i can uh, quickly ask one or two questions before we close uh, maybe uh, i go from below uh, so uh, mostly they are appreciative about the papers which have come through and uh, there there's one or two questions uh, dr minakshi are you able to figure out uh, yeah it is there so um, one question is from vinit choudhary to suniti dr suniti uh, he has asked uh, suniti ma'am do you think delhi has reached the herd herd immunity level okay do you okay, think I'll, delhi has reached the herd immunity level okay i'll take up that uh, question vinit that's a very nice question you know for mm -hmm. any uh, community level uh, immunity you know uh, herd immunity we have de uh, derived this term and coined this term but it is you know uh, community um, Uh, community immunity so at one particular time at a particular time say if i talk about this particular uh, month the 80 to 80 percent 70 to 8, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the population should be entirely infected and recovered so this is how uh, community immunity is achieved so right now delhi has not reached that stage of uh, community immunity which can only happen once the vaccination drive pops in and a large set of people are um, uh, are uh, immunized and vaccinated and then the infections are reduced the spread of infection is reduced to the use of adequate measures such as mask sanitizers or use of uh, i mean the hand sanitization or the etiquettes of hand sanitization and uh, physical distancing so all these measures have also to be put in place to achieve this particular stage we are not yet in uh, the community immunity stage yes and also uh, there are one or two questions on whether we have enough vaccines for the whole country because we have started the drive but you can see uh, the shortage possibly and also the distance between the two vaccines i mean the gap between the two vaccines Uh, whether that's covered or not. Uh, so i think the first question can be addressed by the pmo office i'm not the right person to comment on that uh, and the uh, second question that about the time period you know every vaccination has uh, a, a, has a method of um, developing antibodies and probably this is crucial so sooner it is the less antibodies are produced so uh, if i would if i would delay the time period to 6 months vaccine uh, the antibodies would again start reducing because these are not the uh, antibodies that would ever be present always so um, for this uh, the clinical trials have showed that a uh, uh, a period from 6 to 8 weeks in terms of the covaxin and uh, 12 to 14 weeks in terms of covishield so this has increased the uh, antibodies present in the individual so probably that can be uh, taken care of when uh, uh, people get vaccinated so i think we should end the meeting here uh, i would like to thank each of the panelists for such wonderful presentations all these papers are going to be there in the book so those uh, who are interested can read 
after the book is uh, published it is published a copy is published already but then because of covid it has got delayed so within few weeks i'm sure it's going to reach uh, in the market and uh, all these papers are very interesting very topical and uh, there are many things which anthropologists want to talk about i think uh, in the honor of professor joshi it's a very good compilation and uh, i would like to again thank each and every participant who have been listening very carefully and uh, uh, interacting with all of us i think uh, dr minakshi can we close the session here and again get back yeah. at the Uh, thank you ma'am thank you for your expert comment and uh, i think few questions are left in the chat box and uh, participant you can uh, answer them on one to one basis uh, you can go through the chat later on because since we are running out of time we cannot deal with each and every question so thank you thank you all of you all the participants and thank you sunita ma'am and over to you vipin sir uh yes thanks uh... the chair professor smita reddy and uh, the co chair dr binakshi for successfully and wonderfully managing this session and thanks to all the speakers for the nice discussion and all the i mean audiences uh, for patient listening the talk and uh, asking relevant questions and uh, thank you to all and please don't forget to join the valedictory session thank you